So I always knew to look for the LDL, right? That's supposed right. to be the bad cholesterol mm-hmm. and the good ones, HDL and your total cholesterol should be lower than 200 and all of that. We knew that triglycerides are there, they're in the chylomicrons, but you actually don't see most of the cardiologists worry about the triglyceride levels. Maybe because very few of us actually hit the 600 mark. Uh, they might be in the 200s or something. They still started on statins. That's what we've always been taught that high cholesterol levels and high LDL levels are going to cause heart disease in you. And you need medications for that uh, and stay away from the saturated fats, which was, I think, just just a whole load of hogwash. Hey guys, thank you so much for watching our videos. If you'd like to support us some more, you can explore our homemade natural skincare products at purelytallow.com. Thank you so much for supporting my small business. Hey guys, welcome back to the Carnivore Revolution. I'm Serena. And today my guest is Encore. Did I get it right? Yeah. He's a, awesome. He's a doctor in India and we're going to talk all things carnivore and low carb today and talk about why you shouldn't be eating the carbohydrates and sugar that you have in your diet now. So thank you so much for joining me. I appreciate it. Thank you, Serena. It's a pleasure to be on the Carnivore Revolution. Thank you so much for being here. So Let's start with like your story. How did you become low carb? What has it helped you with? Um, let's start there and then we'll talk about how you deal with it when you're doctoring. Yeah. So, I mean, I always thought I was a fit guy. I'd, I'd been working out since 2006 and, you know, just basically eating everything I could. Uh, like the trainers would always tell us to eat whatever we can because we were just pumping so much in the gyms, you know, the calorie count didn't actually matter as, as, as per them. And it didn't matter as to what we ate. And uh, since I've uh, been a doctor for many years now, I always thought that I knew everything about nutrition, you know, uh, which I actually did not. Uh, so I got a reality check in 2021, post-COVID, uh, post-COVID that I suffered from uh, in, in the start of 2021. So in about July, I think I did my blood test. And the main thing which was significant was my triglycerides were 600. I didn't even know about triglyceride to HDL ratio at that moment. You know, I know I, I saw him that my HDL was a little on the lower side, but but my triglyceride to HDL ratio came out to be 16, and uh, that was a shocker. I was I thought I thought I was I was fit, and then I spoke to one of my cardiologists, and he obviously told me to cut off uh, sugars, and then I realized that I actually did not know anything about nutrition, and mm-hmm. yeah, I started I started getting into it. Uh, I, I read Metabolical by uh, Professor Robert Lustig from UCSF. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I understood more about metabolic syndromes. Uh, again, as a doctor, I thought I knew metabolic syndrome, but clearly I did not. And I understood that probably I was suffering from uh, uh, metabolic syndrome and I got the reality check on time because 16 as a ratio of TG2 HL is too high. You know, it could have been fatal any time. Yeah. So, I mean, I started, basically I started cutting down my calorie count for, you know, just to begin with. I didn't know about carnivore at that time. I knew a little bit about keto, so I, I cut down on my calorie counts so using using one of those apps that you have, uh, which is just guiding me to cut down my weight. So I was 86 kilos at that time, and it took me about nine months. I got down to about 65, uh, 65 or 66 kilos. That's about 20 kgs. But I was, and I went low carb, definitely. But the one thing I also made a mistake was that I started having a lot of uh, oats uh, and, and some veggies, mm-hmm. and I cut down on my red meat at that time. Before that, I used to have my red meats, you know, and and that was obviously associated uh, with uh, all the carbohydrates that we Indians love to eat, the breads and the naans and the rice and all of that. So yeah, I was I was always I was always a meat eater, and I used to have my meats every day, you know, every day. So I was still a rarity in India because a lot of the omnivores in India actually eat uh, meats once in a while. So basically, yeah. So that was my journey. I, I went into basically a low cal, a little bit of low carbohydrate. I was only having uh, rice as uh, my carbohydrate intake and some oats every morning till uh, somebody sent me a reel of uh, Paul Saladino last year in April and uh, and the whole carnivore thing. And this was before, the reel was before he went a little into animal-based uh, and moved away from carnivore. So, I mean, it was an older reel. Uh, and, and then it made sense to me. And then, you know, I, I saw uh, Joe Rogan's podcast with Sean Baker and then Anthony Chafee and uh, Robert Kills, Ken Berry, all of those, you know, just started off, uh, you know, down the rabbit hole. And it actually made a lot of sense to me. And I actually started researching more into food and nutrition. I went through all the papers that everybody was talking about. I started reading up more. I understood nutrition. It didn't take me too much of time per se, you know, I mean, it took me a, a year 
to actually understand uh, what was happening uh, and it just opened up my eyes uh, as to how ignorant uh, we as doctors have always been regarding nutrition so yeah i mean i i, I went full on carnivore last year uh, i think i became a more stricter carnivore a more strict carnivore since i think maybe september or october of last year i mean the first 3 4 months was like you know a little bit of cheating here and there uh when i was traveling to amsterdam and all you know just have maybe a couple of fries here or there because i was on a holiday but yeah more strict uh, from from october and you know i've noticed a lot of changes in my body and you know i think i think it's it's not a diet for me anymore it's just a lifestyle and mm-hmm. it's it's here to it's here to stay yeah <laughs> so yeah that's been my journey in short yeah i think so many people come to carnivore looking at it like it's a diet um i for one you know i mean i i actually came initially for kind of a health reason it was a post sickness issue um kind of like you um but it's always been about losing weight for me every diet or way of eating or way of life i've ever been on has always been about losing weight getting my ideal weight and staying there you know um and i think we need to change the narrative for people i love how you call it a lifestyle because so many people still look at it like it's just a weight loss diet um and that's not going to work if you look at it like it's a weight loss diet that's not going to work because yeah. what we always do when we diet is we go back to our default later and then people will complain the carnivore diet didn't work for me or low carb or keto didn't work for me as soon as i went back to eating normally i gained all the weight back right so yeah. we have to look at it like it's a way to get to our optimal health and then to stay there we can't look at it like as soon as i hit this goal whatever that goal is I'm going to go off on a binge or I'm going to eat whatever I want, you know. So, I get being on holiday and eating a few fries here and there. Did you notice a difference when you did that though? Like do you feel any different if you add some a little something in? Uh so at that time I didn't because I think my body was still not used to a proper carnivore uh, uh lifestyle. But now I've had it a couple of times, not 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 fries, but you know something like tomatoes a little, little high on fibers or something. Mm-hmm. I guess which is high on fibers and you know i immediately understood uh, that was hurting me you know i mean i think i remember i went for a family party and somebody offered cottage cheese cuz they were vegetarian so like okay fine yeah i mean this this is still okay you know it's made of milk so yeah. not a problem uh, and then about half an hour later it started to hurt me and i was just wondering so i asked them what all they put in that so mm-hmm. there were there were some fibrous uh, vegetables in it uh, which i didn't recognize at that time and there was tomato ketchup so you know i i figured there was something wrong with the two of them it wasn't the cottage cheese which was actually hurting me right uh and and so the tomatoes started to hurt me i mean and you know butter chicken is one of the most famous dishes in india and it's it's full of tomatoes and my wife had cooked it at home once with all the butter and the cream and all of that that's perfectly fine but it really hurt me uh in my stomach yeah and i couldn't figure out so the next time i told her make it without tomatoes and i was absolutely fine mm. so you know yeah uh, i mean uh, those are pro inflammatory foods for me now. <laughs> so let's talk about the rest of your family. So is the rest of your family carnivore too? Yeah, my wife's gone full on carnivore. Uh my son is definitely carnivore but you know because of the school we need to give him some rice or you know potatoes or uh, cottage cheese. So that's okay. Uh we still send him eggs uh, for his breakfast and lunch but otherwise whenever he's home he's having the meats like us. My wife still has a little bit of uh, tea with milk. So that's okay. I mean I got mm-hmm. her off her almonds and peanuts which are really high in oxalates yes. and that had, that had affected her thyroid and once I got her off the two of them you know everything just reversed immediately so now she understands and she sees a difference uh, she was doing more animal based since I turned carnivore last year but she's still having her rice and her chapatis mm-hmm. and stuff and uh, and uh, from January she went full carnivore and she's noticed a difference herself in, in in the way she looks you can still see a little bit of inflammation in the pictures from last year Yeah as compared to the ones this year and same with me you know I mean even though I had lost about 20 21 kilos you could see puffed up uh, face not as much as earlier but you can see the difference from then and now Yeah so yeah so we're all full on carnivores now yeah. That's amazing And so earlier you had mentioned your triglyceride to HDL ratio and that you didn't know about that that you didn't know to look for that and so Don't you think as a doctor you should have known like knowing what you know now don't you don't you look at that now and think why didn't we know why don't doctors know this because we've never been taught i mean we were i always mm-hmm. knew to look for the ldl right that's supposed right. to be the bad cholesterol mm-hmm. and the good ones hdl and 
your total cholesterol should be lower than 200 and all of that but uh, yeah i mean and and we knew that triglycerides are there they're in the chylomicrons and 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 the, a little bit of biochemistry but you actually don't see most of the cardiologists worry about the triglyceride levels maybe because very few of us actually hit the 600 mark uh, they might be in the 200s or something they still started on statins uh, to bring it down i mean that's what we've always been taught uh, that uh, high cholesterol levels and high LDL levels are going to cause heart disease in you and you need medications for that uh, and stay away from the saturated fats which was I think just just a whole load of hogwash uh, it doesn't make sense I mean uh, something which is an essential nutrient for you can never be bad for you uh, yeah so I've done my research and I'm pretty sure that's not the case I think you saw the reel that I put up today it was just a random thing it just it just struck me. I called up one of my residents who's actually doing a research on uh, heart attacks. So I told him, you know, just 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 check out any five random patients that you've had in your data and send me their lipid profiles, you know, just choose mm -hmm. so that there's no bias, you know, just mm -hmm. see whose lipid profiles were done by the cardiologist. And these are the MI patients who actually had to be stented mm -hmm. uh, and then put on statins. And so, I mean, you've seen the lipid profiles. Mm -hmm. They're unremarkable, you know, not, not something that's going to cause heart attacks like people think uh, they would and they were still discharged on uh, on statins yeah and and then I told him look if I mean just see if they're all diabetic or not and it just turned out that all of them were diabetic and they're also included in the other study that we're doing that we had spoken about last time mm -hmm. and I just went through that data and all of them were vegetarians so I think two of them were omnivores who eat meat like maybe once or twice a week or month something like that mm -hmm. but mostly plant-based yeah yeah. So so basically, we we were taught wrong that cholesterol is actually the problem when it's not. It's it's everything else. Yeah. So what is the standard Indian diet? Is it is it a lot like the diet we have here in America? You know, we call it the sad diet. Um, the standard yeah. American diet is just sad. It's just it makes and it makes people sad. It's really just the perfect acronym <laughs> um, for the food that we eat here in America normally. And so, is it much like that there in India? So I think the only uh, similarity the two of them have are the carbohydrate loads. The sad diet usually has a lot of uh, processed foods in them. Like, you know, I mean, you, you can have donuts or pizzas or burgers, even for breakfast or lunch and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we usually reserve the desserts for dinners. Or we don't start off the day with uh, desserts. Uh, I mean, in America, I've seen a lot of people have donuts for breakfast, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the cereals are definitely something that uh, the sad and the SID both have uh, but even if you go to people who don't have the processed cereals you know they would still be uh, downing oats or chia seeds or flax seeds or other kinds of breakfast like you know we've got something like uh, pav bhaji which is basically potato which is uh, potato curry and uh, breads for breakfast you've got something called chole bhature which is again chickpeas and uh, refined flour and all fried in ref in, in uh, refined seed oils uh, that's that's also another staple breakfast for a lot of people. Uh, you have the usual bread and butter, definitely. Some people definitely have their eggs and all, but then again, uh, they do have carbohydrates with it. So, you know, even, even for lunch and dinners, people will have rice or chapatis or potatoes, sweet potatoes. And, and for dinners, usually people can have uh, all of this again, maybe some meats, but then again, it'll be uh, accompanied with a lot of carbohydrates. So yeah, and, and probably on the weekends, people do go out, you know, for their apparent cheat meal. They don't realize they've been cheating the whole week. Uh, so yeah, right. they'll go out and have the pizzas and burgers and donuts and whatnot. So yeah, that's going to happen. And and desserts are usually a staple also for India, even, even on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in India have a sweet tooth, a lot. Yeah, um, well... And it's in their defense, it's not their sweet tooth's fault. It's the sugar and it's the, you know, the yeah. ingredients, it's all addictive. Absolutely. So it's, it's not their sweet tooth's fault, but it is their responsibility. You know, that's the thing yeah. that I've learned is that it's not your fault that you're addicted to these foods, but it is your responsibility to fix it and get yourself unaddicted to all of those things. Um, and so yeah. how do you handle this in practice with your patients, knowing that most of the country, is it, is it like it is here? Most of the country is sick and riddled with diseases, right? And almost everybody's yeah. on medication past a certain age and even younger, you know, than, than it is certainly a lot younger than it used to be for people to be taking medications that they'll probably have to be on for the rest of their lives. So how do you handle this in practice as a doctor? So, uh, so I'll, I'll take it in two ways. So one is uh, by setting an example, right? So mm -hmm. uh, 
in my department uh, no sugars are allowed for any of the patients or the relatives wow uh, yeah, and uh, we we don't let the fnb bring in any uh, fruit juices to them and and if any of them complain you know they're all uh, asked to come and speak to me and you know that starts off a conversation and it's so surprising that most of them are diabetic or actually asking for the sugars they know it's bad for them they're like i'll just take my medication right so that's right. that sets off that sets off a conversation between us uh, the second is that we're actually doing a research where we're including all the patients who come in with non communicable diseases and we're asking them what the uh, what the dietary preferences are and it's not just a simple yes or no question or just a one question it's a 32 question uh, questionnaire which is quite comprehensive we've taken in a lot of confounding factors also regarding uh, you know smoking or drug habits alcohol the oils they use uh, are you a vegetarian or an omnivore or a carnivore vegan all of that and if mm-hmm. if you're anything but a vegetarian or a vegan so if you're a pescatarian how frequently do you eat fish on an average i know i mean it, it goes into the food frequency channel but you know we're not asking how many times do you eat last week you know not not like that but on an average as to what they can think of and it's not that difficult cuz most of them either say once a week or or once a month that's not very difficult for them to remember right so yeah we have all of that and once we start asking all of these questions they understand that you know we're doing something and then that sets off another set of a conversation between my team and the patients and they usually give my example i mean they share the spotify i mean my podcast and my instagram handle and all and there are a lot of pictures all over the department uh, of my team and us uh, and you know they they bring the patients of the attendants they can go see that this is what i used to look like and this is what i am right now and uh, yeah so i mean so th- that's the way we start uh, the conversations and I, you know give them like a quick 5 or 10 minute lecture uh, as to what nutrition is all about and how mistaken we are cuz you know most of them think that they're eating healthy but clearly they're not that's why they land up in the hospital and that's something that really strikes them at that time when i ask them i mean if you've been eating healthy why are you on 15 medications for all of these things mm-hmm. you know uh, and then some of them actually uh, understand some of them are still under the influence of the carbohydrate addiction and they refuse to believe it or refuse to understand it but but i'm glad that my team has started to understand cuz you know i mean there is not just me talking uh, that becomes a little difficult now my team has tried to actually see the same things the, the, they've understood the pattern that's 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 happening you know people are eating wrong people are eating uh, just purely vegetarian food and you don't get proteins and fats from your vegetarian foods so you're left with only one macro to be eaten and that's carbohydrates so you know you keep eating carbohydrates and you end up with all of these diseases and uh, and and they've tried to counsel them themselves you know so yeah i mean uh, it, it's interesting uh, how how you know uh, it's it's rubbing off on them mm-hmm. i would say you know and and uh, yeah and 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 they're looking at the doctors who come into my department who are the specialties and they're speaking to the patients and they're telling them you'll need to be on medications your whole life for your diabetes or your or your cholesterol levels and all of that and, and my teams like you know them let them go and then we'll speak to the patient again that they can actually get off the medications you know so yeah i mean that, that's i mean we we're on the carnivore revolution right now i hope that we are starting a revolution in in my department <laughs> as <Yeah>. of now <laughs> that's awesome i hope so too and then there's so much evidence do you talk to people about um about because i'm sure that your patients say oh but what about my cholesterol and so do you have the conversation with them about how high cholesterol isn't the problem it's a low cholesterol that's the problem and do you talk to them about uh the fact that there are more instances of dementia and alzheimer's disease in people with low cholesterol and how do they take that news because that's pretty that's a pretty surprising statistic there yeah i i, I don't think they understand cholesterol as of now but i've had this conversation with a couple of my cardiologists who had had patients come in and these were young patients come in with uh, heart attacks and i asked them what do you think what's the reason for his heart attack you know he's not a, he's not a smoker he's not an alcoholic and uh he has apparently no known comorbids and they're like you know we have to look into that probably cholesterol issue mm-hmm. but he's a pure vegetarian why should he have a cholesterol issue yeah and then they couldn't actually uh, give me a, a, a satisfactory answer to that and i was like you know do you know do you know what the b12 levels would be and uh, how much the homocysteine would be and uh, that is something that they acknowledge yes is you know the patient's homocysteine could be high which can lead to you know sudden clots anywhere in the body so yeah i mean uh, i have not had conversations with my patients regarding cholesterol cuz not many of them are actually having cholesterol issues 
I mean, as in as in high cholesterol, you know, they won't understand low cholesterol right now. Yeah. My aim is for them to understand how the carbohydrates that they're eating is actually causing so much of inflammation and oxidative stress in them that that's actually the main culprit uh, behind everything that's happening to them, you know. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I mean, those are the conversations I have, even even for patients who have a lot of, you know, we have a lot of patients coming in with cancers. So, yeah, I mean, uh, sometimes we have a little chat with them too. Yeah. Absolutely. I think that's so important when somebody comes in with any kind of chronic illness or, um, you know, something that basically is killing them. I think it's so important to talk about the food because so many people don't realize that the food is, is affecting us physically. I mean, people know they don't feel well and people know, you know, eating four pop tarts for breakfast probably isn't healthy. And then adding on top of that, a you know, a Big Mac or, you know, super size meal or whatever, you know, from McDonald's with the Coke, like people know that it's not good for them, but I think they don't realize how detrimental it is to your health. If you eat like that all day, every day, and then how it affects your brain too. Yeah. Yeah. And the bodies, I mean, uh, we, we all know about that case, right? Where I think PepsiCo won a case or the settled outside court where uh somebody had uh i think you put up a video also and i went into that uh about about the mountain dew how somebody found a rat inside mountain dew and pepsi said that you know it's not possible because the rat would have dissolved in the mountain dew since the time of packaging no i don't think i had seen that what? yeah i i saw somebody's uh posts uh sometime today and then i i googled and i found all the news articles and then i found other articles also and then i shared them with some of my friends and they said that they one some of them had found a lizard inside a Coca Cola can or a bottle, and uh, they didn't sue anybody, but they just left it like that. And about a week or two, the lizard dissolved. Oh my goodness! That's what they've got half the population of the world addicted to. I think <laughs> it's true, and people really don't realize that they're addicted to it. I think, I think that's the biggest issue is people don't realize they're addicted, and then when you tell them and they say like okay, I'm going to do a low carb diet. I, I mean, how many people decide to start a low carb diet and in the first four, five, six, seven days change their minds and say, oh, this isn't working. This isn't for me. I don't feel good eating this way. And it's because you're going through withdrawals. You know, people don't realize that they are actually addicted and that that's why they can't do it. They feel like, you know, they make excuses, like they come up with reasons that they can't do it when really it's just that it's hard and it's, it's always hard to get off something that you're addicted to. I mean, ask a Ask an ex-smoker, ask an alcoholic, ask somebody who gave up cocaine, ask them how hard it is to get off mm -hmm. of that because you're going through that same thing when you eliminate the carbohydrates from your diet, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's not that easy. I think the first step towards uh, getting rid of your addiction is to accept the fact that you're addicted mm -hmm. and, uh, and then work towards it. And uh, saturated fats are going to help you do that, I think. Yeah, I agree with that. Eating so much, so much fat. I mean, Honestly, I feel so much better. Just my body feels better. My brain feels better. When I'm eating 90 or 95% fat in a day, which would be, you know, like 17 or 1800 calories worth of fat, that's when I feel my best. It's just that it's really hard to stick to. I do think that something that high fat is not really sustainable, but that is how I feel my best. And I know it's because the fat is so good for me. Yeah, and per gram of fat, you get more calories than per gram of carbohydrates anyways, right? It's more than double of that. I mean, today when I was driving back from work, it took me about three hours to get back home. I was really tired and I just ate like five strips of bacon and I was absolutely fine after that. I'm still not feeling yeah. hungry. Uh, it just filled me up and gave me so much of energy, you know. I, I, I did some work on social media. I did some other work and then mm -hmm. uh, played with my son, had some tea with my wife read a book waiting for a podcast to start and yeah i mean and i'm not feeling hungry at all right it's dinner time yeah but yeah yeah it makes you feel so much better and it keeps you full and satisfied and it doesn't make you crave things it's really just an amazing way to eat so do you have a preference for yourself and um do you recommend other people do you have a preference between grass-fed or conventional meats so uh, it's very difficult to f uh, find grass-fed meats in india okay there are a few there are a few people who were actually tired of uh, selling grass fed meats uh, so i mean uh, the brands like artisan meats and earthy origins and stuff uh, uh, so a lot of the meat that we get here are, is is goat meat so okay. goat meats are usually grass fed meats uh, very rarely do we get uh, grain ones unless and it will be going to the the big uh, the big names over here 
but your local butcher and all usually have grass fed meats uh, chicken is a little uh, you know tricky uh, where you're sourcing it from uh, but as long as it's not packaged chicken or you know frozen chicken uh, i don't go for that so i mean if i recommend anybody i just tell them go get it from your local butchery yeah. it's not going to be that difficult i mean it's still better than having uh, glyphosate laden fruits yeah. and vegetables so yeah. you know uh, that that's important uh, yeah i mean i mean if you go for beef and all uh, in india it's, I, I i wouldn't know where to get grass fed versus grain fed uh, i'm not i'm not sure about that we do get beef in some of the states in india and in, in down south and goa and also whenever i'm there i, I do have my beef but otherwise uh, mostly it's uh, buffalo steak uh, that we get here we get buffalo ribeyes and uh, skirt and tenderloin and all of that so yeah some of the times we do that pork is something that is really really uh, good uh, and it's uh, widely available in india so yeah i mean go for the pork sausages and the bacon and uh, pork belly a lot of dishes a lot of indian cuisine dishes uh, are there based on pork so yeah do that so what does a typical day of eating look like for you so my breakfast starts off with about 4 or 5 eggs uh, and then my lunch is basically either about 500 400 to 500 grams of either chicken or fish prawns puff pork lamb mutton any of that and uh, i do the same for dinner post workout also i have a bit of beef bone broth and uh, which I, which i got from uk uh, mm-hmm. you don't get that in india and uh, some marine collagen so i do that yeah try to get at least about 200 grams of proteins a day that's, that's the plan great. sometimes i have eggs like twice a day you know i mean just before work it gets difficult to make more than 5 eggs for me or four eggs but uh, weekends yeah, on sundays i have like a massive breakfast for sure like pork sausages and eggs and all of that's like probably 100 grams of protein in like one one sitting yeah, we, and we love our pork ribs and pork ch- pork chops that's that's a lot of fun so yeah I, I mean that's uh that that's a lot of proteins and fats in about like 2 or 300 grams so yeah we do that uh, once a week for sure yeah i think eggs are highly underrated i think eggs are like the yeah. perfect food i do know a lot of people though that have like this um limit on eggs like you get through like the fourth or fifth egg and you think if I take one more bite, I'm going to be sick. There's something about mm-hmm. an egg for me that, I mean, I think I ate six at a time. I ate six all at once one day last week, but that last bite was hard to get down. I don't know if it's the texture. I don't know what it is, but there is, and that never happens with steak or anything. And I love eggs. Like I said, I think they're highly underrated. I, I eat eggs almost every day, sometimes twice a day like you, but I have like this tolerance for eggs. Like there, I don't know if it's the texture. I don't know what it is, but I've heard other people, Courtney just said that the other hmm. day. I've heard other people say that too. Like that bite just won't go down. Like, okay, I'm done. Like sometimes mixing up the way I eat them, like scrambled or um, you know, really fried, like to where they're crispy versus not quite as fried. And then eating them like as an egg salad or eating hard boiled eggs, or like if I mix them up and eat them different ways, that doesn't happen as much, but, um, but it's interesting. And I've heard other people say that too. But yeah, I mean, eggs are just so versatile. I think there's no other carnivore food, which is as versatile as eggs. Cause you have so many different ways of cooking it. Mm-hmm. What there, there's one recipe, uh, uh, which which one of my friends had taught us and it's basically like a double fry you know uh, you have a sunny side up and you just flip it over okay. yep. and you add some white pepper and salt uh, and make it in ghee put loads of ghee so you know it's still mm-hmm. it's yeah. still it's not like dried up you know yes. maybe add some sprinkle of onions and coriander if you really want to do that yep. so I get that done and you know it's it's made on a on a on a flat stove a flat iron stove uh, and uh since you eat it one by one, mm-hmm. you know, you, you cook one and then you eat it and you cook another one and you eat it. So I've done like about seven or, seven or eight in one sitting. So my wife's cooking and I'm like, you know, give me one more, give me one more. Yeah. It's easy to swallow. The taste is really different. You can, you can try that out. I mean, if you really yeah. want to and see, see where, how, see if you hit a new limit. <laughs> yeah. People don't, people rate, don't like it when I post it. my like crunchy, crispy eggs. People don't like it when I post that, but I really <laughs> like my whites to be like really crispy and buttery and salty. Like I just Mm. love my whites like that, but a lot of people don't like that. Um, And a lot of people complain about the carnivore diet saying that it's expensive. And I find that the more eggs you eat, the cheaper you eat. I mean, maybe eggs went up in price in the last year. There were a lot of people complaining about the price of eggs, but if you ate eggs for breakfast and lunch, vary the way you eat them so you don't get sick of them. And then you you could even still afford to have a ribeye for dinner. But if you're really on a budget, 
just have some cheap ground beef for dinner and you can eat really inexpensively. I mean, I think you could eat for under $10 a day for the entire day if you just ate eggs and some cheap ground beef. Yeah, and uh, in India, we there are a lot of places where you have a lot of fish markets, you know, and uh, fish is not very expensive in India unless you buy them from one of the supermarkets. Mm -hmm. If you go to the local fish markets, uh, you know, they have the fresh catch of the day and all. Uh, you know, a lot of people I know are doing carnivore by just having eggs and fish. Uh, one, yeah. of, one of my one of my ward girls, her husband her was diabetic. He he had an HB one C of eleven, and obviously um, they're not uh, as well off as others. But uh, he brought it down to five point four just on eggs, fish, mm -hmm. and uh, goat meat. That's Amazing. it, and he could afford it. Yeah, he could afford it. So yeah, I mean, it can be done for sure. I mean, one needs to just get their heads behind it. That's awesome. And do you have any book recommendations for people? Have you read any good carnivore or nutrition books people should read? Oh well, yeah, definitely Sean Baker's uh, the carnivore yeah. the carnivore diet. Yeah, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Paul Saladino's Carnivore Code. Uh, Diana Rogers' The Sacred Cow is really nice. Mm -hmm. Lear Keats' uh, The Vegetarian Myth. Mm -hmm. That's a good one too. Yeah, that what was about, an eye opener. What about Sally Norton's um, Toxic Superfoods? You toxic mentioned Super, Oxalate. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sally Norton's uh, Toxic Superfoods. I'm right now going through uh, uh, Nina T. uh The Big Fat Surprise. It's yep. fantastic. What a read. I was just going to ask you about pages, that one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I was just going to ask you, because I've actually listened to that book on Audible five times, no, six times, because I listened oh. to it again in June. Uh, that book, every time I listen to it, I'm shocked and dismayed all over again. Every time I listen to it. I've got a couple of books which I've read, uh, which I've actually got. I, they still need to be read. One is uh, John Yetkin's uh, Sugar. It's I forgot the name, but it's on sugar, obviously. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, when he was fighting Ansel Keys regarding sugar oh, versus yeah. fats, yeah. And uh, there's another another one from uh, the the anthropologist uh, Will Jaimer uh, about his uh, trips to the Arctic Circle with the Eskimos, mm -hmm. where he's actually documented how much of fats they eat. Uh, that's the, like really thick book. Yeah. So yeah, I'm just going to take my time and then, you know, start that off. So that's, I think that's one that I'm going to recommend. And then I have a few which are in the pipeline on my Amazon uh, cart, <laughs> which yeah. I still have to order, you know. My yeah. son's like, you know, you keep ordering books, you don't read all of them. I'm like, yeah, <laughs> it's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> I know. That's why I do audiobooks because I can listen to those while I'm out walking, while I'm lifting weights, while I'm, you know, getting ready in the morning, I can, while I'm cleaning, when I'm driving, I can listen to an audiobook just about any time. And so it's very rare that I pick up a paper book and read it. I do have paper copies of a lot of the books that you mentioned, but I've listened to them already. And then I just buy them. So I have the paper copy. I don't know. <laughs> so I can show them to people. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. And another one, which I really recommend is that's how I started off, right? Metabolical by Professor Robert yes. Lustig. Mm -hmm. It's not about carnivore per se, but then it's got a lot of stuff about how you know, what sugar does to you, what are the effects in your body, physiological effects, the pathological effects, uh, what are processed foods doing to us, you know, how how uh, they're all changing our epigenetics and, you know, glycation, mitochondrial dysfunction. Uh, there's a bit of science in that. Uh, how, do, how, how to differentiate between grass-fed, grain-fed meats, how to differentiate between pasture-raised eggs and farm-fed eggs, all of that. So really, really nice. Uh, you know, I think that could be, a, that could be one of the books that if you really want to understand metabolic syndromes start off with that and then you know mm -hmm. you'll you'll find uh you you'll find your way for sure so if you had one piece of advice for people what would it be cut off all junk foods yeah they call junk for a reason mm -hmm. it's not meant for us so you know cut that off and then and then you'll understand what's happening with your body yeah because that just that alone will make such a big difference right yeah 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 absolutely yeah yeah i mean Thank we keep so talking much. about carbs we keep sorry we keep talking about carbs but yeah, these are the carbs you want to cut off first and then see where the rest of the carbohydrates uh, uh, take you, you know, you yeah. figure it out. Thank you so much for being here. I think this was a great conversation. Yeah, I had a lot of fun. Thank you so much for having me, Serena. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on the Carnivore Revolution.